excited about this. I've been looking forward to this one, by the way. Yeah, I'm excited too. Uh, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth installment of the 2021 River Sticks reading series. My name is Molly Harris. I'm the managing editor of River Sticks Literary Magazine, and I'll be your host for tonight. There is a $5 suggested donation, which you can pay through the link in our chat. Uh, to get us started, I'd like to thank the following for their support. The Regional Arts Commission, the, the Missouri Arts Council, the Missouri Humanities Council, and the Kranzberg Arts Foundation. Finally, I'd like to thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. I would like to take a moment to remind everyone to please keep themselves muted while our writers are speaking. If you would like to give kudos or a comment, feel free to utilize the chat box feature. Uh, tonight, we have three amazing writers, Vivian Gibson, Roy Guzman, and Sequoia Nagamatsu. Vivian Gibson was raised on Bernard Street in Mill Creek Valley, 454 acres in the heart of downtown St. Louis that comprised the nation's largest urban renewal project beginning in 1959. She's the author of the memoir, The Last Children of Mill Creek. Vivian was a contributing playwright of 50 and 50, Writing Women Into Existence, performed at the Billy Holiday Theater in Brooklyn, New York. Vivian received an AFA degree in apparel design from the Fashion in, in Institute, Institute of Technology in New York City and earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Fon Bonn University. Washington University St. Louis also honored her as one of its most astounding students in 2020. In 2012, when she received her master's in nonprofit management at the age of 63, she currently leaves, lives less than a mile from what was the historic Mill Creek Valley community in downtown St. Louis. That she also writes about. Take it away, Vivian. Okay. Well, thank you, Molly. I've uh, pulled a, a few short pieces from uh, throughout the book, uh, so I hope um, they don't seem so disjointed when I read them, but they're from different parts of the book. Uh, the first two parts introduces you to my parents and uh, the last part introduces you to some of my siblings and the uh, watchful child who's uh, writing this book, which is me. My mother grew up as privileged as a black girl in a small Alabama town could be. Her grandparents and great grandparents had been enslaved there in Tuscaloosa County and they remained there to share crops on the very same farms they had worked as Dempsey Williamson's and, and Catherine Fawcett's slaves. Generations later, my mother's family bore the evidence of the open secret of the South, people of mixed black and white ancestry, listed as mulatto in the US census as late as 1920. No one openly discussed their origins. Mulattoes lived among their black and white relatives like beautiful hybrid roses with thorns no one dared touch. By the early 1900s, free from the yoke of sharecropping, Mama's father farmed his land and owned the colored store, euphemistically known as the People's Store. His accomplishments made him a highly respected and well-positioned man in the community. He often served as a conduit between the black and white residents of Northport, Alabama, facilitating vital legal and business transactions. Whites purportedly designated such a person in every black community in every Southern town, perpetuating colorism that sustained a social order that divided the human race. Her name was Frances Elizabeth Hamilton a lyrical aristocratic name that suited her. The second syllable in Francis seemed to compel anyone, everyone to smile and then pause with expectation when they said her name, Francis. Can you imagine your name always ending with a smile? Francis was the golden child of the five Hamilton children a bit rebellious, athletic, outgoing, creative, and smart. Roles for females were evolving in the mid-1930s, just in time for Frances, who was headed off to college. Soon, the controlled freedom of a college campus would open up a new world for her. My father, 
was the grandson of Mississippi slaves and the son of a thrice married and divorced mother who had cleaned white people's homes and cared for their children in two states by the time they settled in St. Louis in 1929. They joined the wave of blacks moving north to escape the tyranny of Southern apartheid to see, and to seek better education for their children. Arriving when he was 14, he attended the newly constructed Bashan High School, built to accommodate the city's fast growing black community in Mill Creek. In 1937, when he met my mother, she was on a summer break from Talladega College and he was a truck driver who sang baritone in a quartet on weekends. He was handsome with a deep, dark, smooth complexion punctuated with dimples when he smiled, revealing behind his full lips, beautiful white teeth that shone like China. But nothing in his early years in the South and little in the crowded cold water row houses of Mill Creek had prepared my father for my mother. She was a six foot tall, rail thin college basketball star whose milky white complexion and shock of chestnut brown curls drew all eyes when she entered the room. Her subtle Alabama accent and mischievous smile embodied sophistication and breeding, the likes of which daddy had never seen. They married a year and a half later. Mama's years as a wife and mother in St. Louis bore little resemblance to her early years, but her small town Southern Barry was always perceptible beneath the surface of, her urban, of the urban poverty in which she found herself. She was different from the other women on Bernard Street. They had all traveled from Arkansas, Mississippi, and Alabama in the great migration north during the 1920s and 30s. But to those who knew her before, it was surmised that mama had left the better life behind. Just about every city dwelling child of the 1950s has a tale about having to be home when the street lights come on. When daylight began to wane, children of all ages knew where they were supposed to be. They drifted homeward as if pulled by invisible apron strings to avoid the ultimate embarrassment of having their mothers come to look for them. My rowdy brood of seven sisters and brothers was no exception. Winter or summer, no matter the weather, we stayed outside as long as we could. When the street lights came on, my younger brother Furman and I had to go inside. The older kids had to be in front of the house, usually huddled around the lights so that mama could see them from her window. My older brother Randall was routinely missing. Mama would eventually exit the rickety screen door and plant her feet on the paintless planks of the side porch like an Amazon warrior in a cotton print house dress. Her natural beauty was accentuated by an ever-present errant curl that she brushed back with a single sweeping motion of her hand, circling upward, then around to come to rest at her mouth. With her thin lips pulled back tightly against her teeth, her thumb and middle finger expertly curved to almost touching between her slightly parted lips, Mama took a deep breath through her nose and forced air from her lungs, over her tongue and through her teeth and fingers to make a piercing whistle. A two-part bird-like shriek that skidded on the night air and carried to the middle of our city block. Only then, only then did Randall coolly stroll to the waiting glow of the street light. He hung back just out of sight every night so that his friends could hear and be in awe of his mother's unrivaled summons. 
Daddy, Daddy was rarely home in the evening when the molded concrete lamppost topped with frosted gloss orbs glowed softly to usher in the close of the day. But occasionally he would whistle too. His sound was louder and more menacing than Mama's. We didn't hear his, his signal often, but it had a distinctive whoosh and snap like the crack of a whip. He deftly tucked his bottom lip and forced out a long breathy screech, followed by a rapid staccato of pop, pop, popping air. All the running, jumping, and wrestling children in the neighborhood stopped in their tracks. Eyes wide, heads cocked to one side, and necks craned like a herd of deer in listening poses. They all recognized the salient call. Searching out raw siblings in various groups of playing children, someone could be heard saying, your daddy's home. Even Randall would breathe a, a hushed aw oh, shit. His mind racing to remember what chore daddy might have found undone. When we heard daddy's whistle, we instinctively knew what it meant. Everybody come home right now, and you're probably in trouble. If we were lucky, his whistle simply meant he wanted us close to home. On the front, on the front sidewalk or in the backyard. The backyard, just before dark, is where we could always see the cat. That's what we call the mottled gray muscular tabby that roamed, that roamed the perimeter of our cold water two family dwelling. It strode, brushing against the fences between the yards and the back alley. A predator methodic, methodically patrolling its territory. I always knew it was there, but I didn't look directly at it. We never thought of the cat as a family pet. It was utilitarian, practical, like a farm animal, animal. Its purpose was to control the rats. We didn't name it or touch it. We didn't feed it. Mama must have given it water and scraps during, during the day, which accounts for its loyalty to our house. All we wanted was for the cat to hunt rats at night. But late in the fall and winter, the rats came inside at night. Daddy and the boys plugged holes with steel wool, held in place with chicken wire, and hammered flattened tin cans in corners where the floor and the baseboard met. Huge, powerful rat traps had permanent positions in the stone wall basement where my brother slept in the summer. On a brisk November evening, my brother Honey and I were sitting on the back steps waiting for the last light of day to fade before we had to go inside for the night. The cat slowly emerged from behind the coal shed at the far end of the backyard and paused as if to indicate it was her yard now. Honey glanced up and rising from the step confess to an unasked query. I'm more afraid of the cat than the rats, especially at night when they sound like babies crying in the alley. I was reassured to hear it was cats that I heard at night and not babies. As if egged on by the cat's appearance, we entered our dimly lit kitchen and closed the door behind us. I slept every night with my clunky brown school shoes held snug against my chest. Other six-year-old girls might have been snuggled up with a rosy cheek doll or the soft pile of a well-loved teddy bear, not me. I didn't even like dolls and teddy bears. My shoes were my security against the threat of the mostly unseen nighttime rats that scurried across our floors and gnawed at something from within the walls next to our bed. Every, 
everybody had their nighttime maneuvers for dealing with the rats. The older girls used the toilet before going to bed and didn't have to get, didn't have to get up during the night. That didn't work for me. Mama said I had a small bladder. In a moderately success, successful attempt to curtail my bedwetting, I'd hold tight to my trusted shoes just in case I had to get up and go to the toilet in the dark. With all the courage I could muster, I'd throw a shoe as hard as I could into the middle of the floor and wait for the rats to retreat deeper into the walls. My brother, Honey, who coached me on my nocturnal plan of action, slept with his trusty stick and could occasionally be heard striking a sharp blow to the floorboards. Sometimes at night, when all was finally quiet, there would be an abrupt but familiar skirmish followed by a cacophony of screeching and squeaks, scratching claws, thumps, and thuds. At first, I sucked in a sharp breath and stiffened, then raised my head slightly to hear with both ears. My eyes opened wide against the darkness of the middle room where I slept in one of four bunk beds. My brother Furman slept peacefully at the opposite end. Staring into the night, I didn't want to see anything. My wide open eyes just made me more alert. I listened with my whole body. After a long tense minute of quiet, I could hear the cat crunching on the bones of a dead rat. A calm washed over me. I relaxed. I was safe. The cat had done its job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. That was so um, really stunning. It's so good to hear from you. Um, up next is Roy Guzman. Uh, they are the Honduran poet whose first collection, uh, Catracho, was published by Grey Wolf Press in 2020. Raised in Miami, Roy is the recipient of the 2019 grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. In 2017, they were named a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellow. They are also the recipient of the 2017 Minnesota State Arts Board Initiative Grant and the 2016 Gazelle Award for Excellence in Poetry. Their work has been included in Best New Poets 27 Anthology, guest, edi guest edited by Natalie Diaz, and Best of the Net 2017, guest edited by Eduardo C. Corral. Take it away. Thank you so much, Molly, for that introduction. And um, it's an honor to read after Vivian and before Sequoia. Um, I just want to, um, I want to give thanks to the River Sticks reading series for this opportunity. And I also want to acknowledge that I am reading for, from Minneapolis, um, the site of lots of um, necessary conversations, but, um, you know, um, lots of violence um, against Black people. And so I want to acknowledge um, the murder of Dante Wright and um, um, the need for movements like Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm going to be reading some excerpts from a, um, I, was, I was inspired to read prose po uh, poetry today. Um, because I'm um, with two prose writers. Um, some of these uh, pieces came out in Poem a Day, the series out of poets.org, um, but there's more. It, it's a long, long, long piece. And so I'm going to be reading some um, of those um, excerpts from The Age of Aquarius. In The Age of Aquarius, give or take, Plurality overtakes singularity. History becomes bored by its self-referentialism. Triangles burrow into single lines. Equal signs collapse on the spikes of other equal signs. In the age of Aquarius, give or take, 
We give birth to information and information delivers us. I make a fist and my fist speaks in four languages. Letters enter me and suddenly I experience flavors few before me have. In the age of Aquarius, give or take, gender is a tree, is a building, is a cloud. It is anything that hasn't been said. The truest instinct one listens to more and more. Let the sun shine, let the sun shine in, the sun shine in. I have learned to repeat these words to myself whenever I feel stuck. Fear rustles mantras out of my body. I have risked a motherland. Why not also seduce the foreigner who implores nativity if loneliness can be broken and shared? The heavens aureolate capricious. The universal laws have finally understood their lawlessness and so they have embraced it. In the film Black Swan, the character of Thomas Leroy tells Nina Sayers, a 28-year-old ballet dancer, that she's perfect as the white swan, but lacks the darkness the black swan demands. He recommends going home to masturbate. Quote, live a little. New Age puts a price on anything you have no investment on whether it lives or dies. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace guides the planets and love steers the stars. Our first winter together, we spend more time in each other's places. One roommate is upset. Your two cats are tearing through the, her couch. You say she signed up for this when she decided to move in with you. Your fourth roommate leaves a mess in the kitchen, makes you look like a prince in comparison. In your, bed, in your bedroom, mandala sheets hang as if crucified from a hovering wall. To survive is to find patterns within the chaos. I haven't decided if that's the moral flaw. Or you stay in my studio. I buy an expensive bed because I want you to sleep comfortably. Anything is expensive when it costs more than a futon and requires me to open a new line of credit from a mattress company that ends up closing anyway. Months later, when we decide to move in together, you hang the same sheets from our bedroom walls, our ceiling. While I find them gaudy, I say nothing. Living with another individual demands some gesture of sacrifice. I am both okay with having written this previous sentence and rolling my eyes. It shows maturity, but it also shows cautiousness. Two years after you find our relationship irremediable, I tried to donate the mattress, the bed frame, and the mattress foundation to a thrift store, but they only accept some parts, regardless of whatever story, I'm ready to tell them about how well I took care of the bed. I drive the U-Haul truck, through the store's tight alley. Notice how anything I've written about donating our former bed could also be said about our relationship. Scales tilted in your favor, susurrated debt accumulation, mattress stores choosing the wrong shopping strip to run their business, 
overcompensating for used furniture as if I were the one buying it, the store's boundaries, the narrow alleyway that gave me the sensation of being sucked into a vortex to then regret having come across a main street. Maybe this is an ode to the debts one gets oneself into for the sake of validating a dismembered relationship. When Hair, the American tribal love rock musical debuts on Broadway in April of 1968, it becomes the first production to include a nude scene with the entire cast. Around the same time, Star Trek has popularized the phrase where no man has gone before. Our bodies contain elements of outer space so that when we're naked, we are gazing at the universe. I grab your hand each time we cross the bridge across the highway to go to the gay bar. Your eyes read weakness in this action. I rely less and less on you to prove my independence despite the earth swallowing me whole. The first time it overtakes my body, it compels me to roll off my parents' couch and unspool myself on the floor. The second time feels like a drum roll up the left side of my chest. I run from the second bedroom. We've turned into an office and into the living room. I jump in place, rocketing into an invisible ceiling, trying to shake it loose. I negotiate the odds of leaving our apartment, knocking on any neighbor's door to hold me still. I wonder what getting naked in the street would trigger in the neighborhood's dormant unconscious. I can't think of anyone else to call but you. You're having a panic attack, you say, not quite knowing what to do with my shaking. Tears suffuse uncontrollably on my face. I purr into the portable fan we run all day even though it's below freezing outside. The night of my second panic attack, after getting released from the hospital and determined to change my mental health scores, I dream of a nebula in the shame of an octopus holding an astronaut in each tentacle. From my perspective, the cosmonauts feed on all my arms. In the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the dominoes in me cascade one above the other until I watch myself sleep, forbidden from re-entering my body. They call it depersonalization. For two weeks, I wake up shaking in the arms of a doubtful skyline. The bedroom isn't sold on where to draw the edges of my bed or feet. The floor shake. I crack eggs for breakfast and end up misinterpreting what hands are used for. Loneliness asks if I am well. That might be the catch in having one word serve the spirit purposes or holding on to disreputable power, the disreputable power of the passive voice when nothing shuffles towards one direction, one's direction. My mother breaks down in Spanish and I paste her back in more than one medical language. I weep because others call the inlet chemical. I sleep on inhibitors, re resistors. I can convince my aura not to drown in the confidence of my body misrenderings. I think about Van Gogh's empastic circles and starry night, how doubt vibrates under any thick coating of jubilation, how there are insufficient suns to claim the endless evening from which possibility skulks. I think of what Van Gogh suddenly heard when he severed the umbilical cord of sound, smoking a pipe to the moment unfolded. It was body to him, the cave from which man stumbles inelegantly or the world one can navigate only through the tiniest and most remorseful embarkations. Let the healing process begin. 
Let the boxes accrue in the office. Let you sit quietly on the couch. Let the bathroom light become redundant. Let your hands tilt your phone away from me. Let this sunshine indicate when I should breathe. Let me take a look at the screen. Let you arrange a grinder hookup. Let the yellow, the black, and the blue. Let me say, really, so soon? Let you say, what? So what? Let you admit and whitewash. Let me return from the wedding in California. Let me come back from California to nothing. Let me check on my mother's health. Let my mother check into the hospital for a fourth time. Let my mother manage her vertigo. Let me imagine all the ways a plane might drop from the sky. Let me ask you why you haven't bothered to ask me about my mother. Let me can't do this anymore happen over the phone. Let me secure another apartment because I can no longer live with you. Let you call me a handful. Let me apologize to you for calling you a monster. Let me forget about the apartment you purchased. Let me forget about the money I loan you so the bank could approve your mortgage. Let you borrow my vacuum because you need to prepare your new apartment. Let you congratulate me for having been named a finalist for a writing award. Let you approach me to give me a hug. Let me take a step back. Let you decide that this is clearly an indication that I'm not over the breakup. Let me smile like the bitch I can be. Let me share that I'm having the best sex of my life. Let you go quiet. Let myself cut ties I have with you. Let myself live a few blocks from you. Let me sometimes look in the direction of your of your apartment. Let myself do this until I have no reason or need or desire to. Let you stroll with the man in front of my building. Let you stroll under the overpass by the basilica. Let you stand on the tip of your toes and lean forward to catch me holding my second dog, a lap retriever mix that overwhelms me with love. Let me cross the street among so many people, one of them my fiance. Let us go back to in February, left behind another road to plow. Let me forget for brief moments how to inhabit my tools. Let the trees bow to the lakes. Let all of this be in the name of impermanence. Let me fill the wrench at first with a dosage of terror. Let me learn what no one in my family could have taught me. Let me tilt my head backwards like a parrot, repeating the language of the ceiling. Let my immigrant nightmares get recorded in di divorce semiotics. Let me begin by calling my raising thoughts rain. And when they vanish into a thing I can't pronounce with one mouth or gather with originality, let me turn the pages of the book of insanity. Let a part of me decline to be delivered on time. Let me prefer the propaganda of half-truths. Let me watch a man scoop the interior bankruptcy of his dog in the neighboring garden. Let every street hold this man. Let the stained bricks become glued with tender sociability in the alley. Let the Christmas lights continue their coup. Let me be unwilling to diagnose what the corner has to say after I've made a turn. In silence, let me count my breath and curl them into structure chastisements. Let anything that doesn't fit my preoccupations huddle me to fish eat from my shameless body. Let me repeat the conductor's orders. Let a diligent train, train coil triumphantly in place inside of me. Then let it burst into flames until there is only sunshine. And then let the sunshine, and then let the sunshine, and then let the sunshine, and then let the sun shine, and then let the sun shine, and let the, the and then let the sun shine, and then let the sun shine in. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. That was very beautiful. Such a powerful ending. 
Um, finishing up for the night is Sequoia Nagamatsu. Sequoia Nagamatsu is the author of the forthcoming novels, How High We Go in the Dark and Girl Zero, as well as the short story collection, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone, a silver medal winner, winner of the 2016 Forward Reviews Indies Book of the Year Award, an Entropy Magazine Best Book of 2016, and a notable book at BuzzFeed. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in publications such as Conjunctions, The Southern Review, Tin House, and elsewhere. And he has been listed as notable in Best American Non-Required Reading and the Best Horror of the Year. He teaches creative writing at St. Olaf College and the Rainier Writings Workshop Slow Residency MFA program. He lives in Minneapolis with his wife, the writer Cole Nagamatsu, and their cat, Kalahira, their real dog, Fenris, and a robot, robot dog named Calvino. Thank you um, very much um, for inviting me to um, this event. Um, thank you to River Stex. Um, it's uh, so wonderful to hear. Um, it's been a long day and obviously we've been kind of living in this um, age of like Zooming all day, but it's very, I think, inspiring and energizing to hear um, creative writing being read, um, whether that be poetry or memoir um, at the end of the day. Um, so it's kind of a privilege to follow um, you know, both Vivian and, and Roy tonight. So I'm gonna be reading, um, I guess the opening from my novel, uh, How High We Go in the Dark, which comes out um, next January, uh, 2022. Um, and what you need to know, I guess, you don't really need, need to know much as I'm reading from the, from the opening is that it's, uh, um, a novel that spans um, several generations and the time periods begin 30,000 years ago, all the way up to thousands of years in the future, um, focusing primarily on the 2030s and kind of the generations that, that follow from there. What has happened in this novel is that um, in part due to climate change, uh, an Arctic plague, a climate plague has, has been unleashed and um, obviously, it's a very prescient thing to um, be reading about and, 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 and writing about uh, during this time. It's a, a project that I've been working on for about 10 years. Um, and I think, you know, certainly um, editing this novel and, and selling this novel during um, COVID-19 um, has been um, surreal, to say the least. And um, I've, I've been, I think, thankful to, to work on this project with so many talented people because, um, you know, as sometimes uh, the, the subject matter, you know, can be difficult, but it's also been very cathartic and um, allowing me to work through um, some of my own tragedies. Um, you know, this year, my, my father passed away, for example. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, if you read the novel, um, you'll, you'll kind of find that hope and are able to transcend the moment and learn from the moment um, as well. So this first section is, is called 30,000 Years Beneath the Eulogy. I'm gonna set my alarm clock here. Okay. In Siberia, the thawing ground was a ceiling on the verge of collapse, sodden with ice melt and the mammoth detritus of prehistory. The kilometer long Batakaiga crater had been widening with temperature rise, like some god had unzipped the snow-topped marshlands exposing woolly rhinos and other extinct beasts. Maxime, one of the biologists on staff and a helicopter pilot pointed to the copper gash in the earth where my daughter had fallen after discovering the 30,000 year old remains of a girl. We circled the research about outposts, a network of red geodesic domes peeking right below the tree line before landing in a clearing. Maxime helped me out of the chopper, grabbed my bags and a sack of mail from the back. Everybody loved Clara, he said. Don't get weirded out if people don't talk about her though. Most of us keep that kind of stuff to ourselves. I'm just glad to hear, I'm just here to help, I said. Right, of course, Maxime said. There is of course another matter. I half listened as I studied the land, breathed air like the fossils beneath us that seemed trapped in time. He explained that a quarantine had put, put into effect while we were in flight. No one had expected me to come finish Clara's work, let alone so soon. Inside, the outpost central dome looked and smelled like a dorm common room with a big screen television, worn recliners, and a stockpile of mac and cheese boxes. 
The walls were covered with a mixture of topographical maps and movie posters, everything from Star Wars to Pretty Woman to Run Lola Run. Down the accordion-like halls, I could see unkempt people emerging from their bunks or labs. A woman in a purple windbreaker and running leggings sprinted across the room. I'm Yulia, welcome to the end of the world, she said, and disappeared into one of the eight tunnels radiating out of the central dome. The team was now nestled into the hall walls like a cells in a beehive surrounding me with a musty scent of over, of over a dozen researchers. Everybody, this is our guest of honor, Dr. Cliff Miyashiro from UCLA. Archaeology and evolutionary genetics, Maxime said. He'll be helping us out with Clara's discovery. I know all of us lab rats will get even weirder, weirder, weirder now that we're not allowed to leave the site, but try to be nice. Maxime assured me that the quarantine was precautionary since the team had successfully reanimated some ancient viruses and bacteria in the melting permafrost. He said government officials watch too many movies. Standard protocol. No one at the outpost seemed sick or concerned. Unwanted orientations into how Clara lived her life were soon followed, where she drank her coffee and gazed up at the aurora, jogged with Yulia, the botanist, the tabletop lotus aromatherapy fountain she and Dave, the epidemiologist, used from their more morning yoga sessions, the cubby where she kept her snow gear that would become my snow gear since we're about the same size, and how for birthdays some of the team would make the trip to the nearest big city, Yakuts, for karaoke, to forget for a moment that the buildings around them were slowly sinking into ancient mud. Can somebody take me to the girl, I asked. There was a notable pause. A researcher in the kitchen put away some plastic cups and a bottle of whiskey he was no doubt bringing over to welcome me. The cluster of disheveled scientists, most of them in flannel or fleece, felt like a repeat of Clara's memorial a month ago. A church filled with her friends and coworkers, most of them whom we've never met before. I shook their hands as they lined up to tell me and my wife, Mickey, how sorry they were. A man with spiky blue hair said he'd once tattooed a star system onto Clara's back a purple planet orbiting three red dwarfs and called her a fucking trip. Our old neighbors reminisced about how Clara used to babysit their twin girls, helped them feel more confident in math. A bald gentleman, her project supervisor at the International Fund for Planetary Survival gave me his card and invited me to continue my daughter's work in Siberia. After the crowd left, I held a Mickey, I was rewatched the slideshow I prepared pausing on a photo of three-year-old Clara at her foster facility. She was holding the purple crystal pendant she had, what she had when we adopted her. We both swore her eyes light, lit up with tiny stars whenever she gazed into it. Outside the funeral home, our granddaughter Yumi played with her cousin despite the heat waves rippling the street. I could smell smoke from the burning marine headlands to the east beginning to creep over the neighborhood. Our daughter never seemed to need us, Mickey said, her voice barely above a whisper, but Yumi does. I clutched the business card in my pocket. At the research outpost, Maxime led me away from the awkward stares of the crew to the mummified remains Clara had found before she died. Annie's in the clean lab, Maxime said. Annie, I asked. Yulia loves the arrhythmics. Her parents are still living in the 80s. She named the body after Annie Lennox. The clean lab consisted of a plastic sheet duct taped from floor to ceiling, separated, separating one side of the bone lab from the other. He handed me a box of latex gloves and a respirator face mask. We don't have funding for anything else, but we try to be mindful of the pathogens we may bring back with us. Probably nothing to worry about 99% of the time, Maxime added. Right, I said, a little taken aback by his cowboy attitude. Some of our colleagues at Pleistocene Park, about a thousand kilometers east, have made progress reintroducing bison and native flora to the land. More vegetation, more large animals roaming the steppes, packs the topsoil, preserves the ice below, helps us keep the past in the past. I doubled up my gloves, pulled on my mask, and stepped through a slit in the plastic. Annie rested on her side, fetal, on a metal table. Preliminary external examination notes. Pre-adolescent homo sapien sapien with possible Neanderthal characteristics. Slight protruding brow ridge. Approximately seven or eight years old. 121 centimeters in length, 
six kilograms in weight, would have approximately been 22 kilograms in life. Remnants of reddish brown hair at temp remain at temples, tattoo on left forearm, three black dots surrounded by a circle punctuated with another dot. Evidence of significant blunt force cranial trauma. Body is covered in stitched garment, likely a mixture of pelts. Seashells not endemic to the region woven into stitching. Further study needed. The tissue around her eyes had shriveled as if she were staring into the sun. The skin around her mouth had begun to recede, revealing a pained cry. I couldn't help but picture Clara as a young girl, or Yumi, who was about this age, traversing the barren plains in search of big game, stalked by giant steppe lions and wolves. Evidence suggests Annie's death might have resulted from a fall, but perhaps this was a mercy in the face of illness. I ran my hands over her clenched fists. Big fucking mystery, Maxime said coming up behind me. Most of our research here is funded in partnership with the International Fund for Planetary Survival. We're supposed to be finding answers. But I'd be lying if all of us haven't been distracted by any. Soil and ice cores, bacterial and viral analysis, the occasional animal carcass. But this, this shit is something else. And of course, there's the unidentified virus that Dave found in preliminary samples he took from all the recovered bodies. Have you run any other scans, tested samples, the shells for one thing? From a small sea snail native to the Mediterranean, Trivia monaca. I mean, there's evidence of Neanderthals and early humans in Siberia near the Atalai Mountains as early as 60,000 years ago, but nothing this far north. The complexity of how the shells are woven into the fabric is highly unusual. Honestly, this needlework would put, put, put my grandmother to shame. It's strange that Annie is the only one with such clothing. The other bodies in the cavern showed evidence of simple fur cloaks. The station debrief file you guys sent over left me with more questions than answers, I said. Well, we've been waiting for someone to take up the task, fill in Annie's story. Clara said she was here for the animals. She wanted to understand the Ice Age biome so we might recreate it. But it always seemed like she was searching for something else. She'd linger at the dig sites longer than any of us. And for someone whose job it was to study what was hidden in the earth, she spent a lot of time staring at the sky. I bet she would have seen Annie as part of her charge too. She was always talking about how the unknown past would save us. For a scientist, she dreamed more like a poet or philosopher. Got that from her mother, I said. As a child, Claire would spend entire afternoons in her treehouse creating. Her teachers called her a genius, and we encouraged her as much as we could. She wrote reports on nebulae with crayons. We defined lists of constellations she'd spotted alongside mythologies of those she'd made up, the cousin of the Pleiades, the dipper that was neither big nor little, but just right. I think I, think I can see that, Maxime said. It's normally easy to get to know people around here, but Clara kept to herself. It took some sleuthing around through her belongings to even find your contact information. She was always about the work, I said. Our eyes both fell to Annie, whose cry seemed to fill the silence of the lab. Maxime nodded and I said I should get some rest after the long trip. He told me Clara's belongings were in a box in her sleeping pod waiting for me. When I departed for Siberia, my granddaughter Yumi sobbed at the airport, even though at almost nine, she insisted that she, she, insisted that she was fine. Mickey asked me again if I was absolutely sure about doing this. At least wait a few months, she said, so you're not heading into winter. But I knew if that if I stayed, I'd delay indefinitely, and the specter of my daughter would have faded from this faraway land. I never could picture the place where Clara had chosen to disappear in her final years. When Yumi asked Mickey and I where her mother was, we would point to a map, search Google images for the Batataiga Bet crater in Northern Siberia. My wife helped Yumi make a paper, a paper mache diorama on the region that they populated with tiny toy bison, dinosaurs, and 3D printed facsimiles of our family on an expedition where time didn't matter. Your mother loves you, I'd reassure Yumi. Her work is important. And part of me believed this, but had also given Clara an ultimatum the last time we were all together, telling her she needed to come home, that it wasn't fair to Yumi or to us. A 
Apart from the postcards and the occasional video calls with Yumi, I hadn't spoken directly to my daughter in over a year. Before I realized her research outpost was an international effort, I'd imagine Clara roughing it in a yurt, falling asleep beneath animal fur, cradled by the light of the Milky Way. I saw now that her sleeping pot was a three by 10 liter cocoon nested into the wall of one of the domes. Lined with thermal fleece, it had LED lighting, bookshelves, a fold away work table and cargo netting for storage. I searched a duffel for her belongings and I found tucked into the netting clothes, to toiletries, one of her disaster journals, a personal diary, an old iPod, a few artifacts she procured on her travels. But the item I'd have most hoped to retrieve, Clara's crystal necklace, was nowhere to be, to be found. I hoisted myself onto her bunk and removed my hiking boots, peeking under the mattress and inside a ventilation grate, anywhere she might have hidden her pendant for safekeeping. My feet had baked during the long journey, the cheese-like odor filled the bunk, mixing with a stale scent of cigarettes and body odor that permeated the rest of the station. I lay back for the first time since leaving America and searched through Clara's iPod, stopping at the Planet Suite by Gustav Holtz. The triumphant horns of the Jupiter movement transported me to happier times when Clara's wonder was still caught up in the stars, like when she insisted her third grade solar system project had to be the correct scale or got in trouble at science camp for inventing a story about the lost sister of the Pleiades that was once visible in the ancient African sky. What did Clara think of when she looked at the cosmos dancing above the gray of the tundra here? I grabbed her diary and began flipping through it, trying to hear her voice again. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Sequoia. I'm really intrigued. I really like the main character. I want to know what happens next. So I'll, I'll look forward to that uh, coming out. Um, so thank you to everyone who read tonight. It was such a really, really intimate and um, really beautiful reading. Uh, we are going to open it up for a quick uh, Q&A. And it looks like we already have some questions in the chat. So I'm just going to get right at it, if that's all right with you guys. Uh, this is for you, Sequoia. This is from Cassie. She asked, um, what kind of research did you need to do for your new novel to make it authentic, such as about climate change, life in the station, et cetera? Yeah, so I mean, um, the inspiration for the novel came from a few places. Um, you know, the, the first segments of the novel, I didn't know it was a novel then, they're just stories. I was living in Japan at the time and uh, my grandfather had recently passed away. And so I was, thinking a lot about how we say goodbye to people and funerary rituals and practices. And, you know, in Japan, there, there's just, because of the aging population, there's this issue of like, okay, where do we, where do we put people? You know, like there, there's just not enough space. Um, how do we, you know, kind of deal with the fact that so many people are maybe away from their hometowns, maybe away from temples. Um, maybe living, their children are living a very, very modern lifestyle, and yet we still want to honor our ancestors in maybe more of a traditional way, whether that be Shinto or Buddhism or, or what have you. And so I came across so many companies, um, and I interviewed people as well, um, that were doing things to try to kind of fill those gaps. And so, for example, there are funerary skyscrapers in my novel. And um, these are things that are starting to become a thing in Tokyo or, or, or other large cities in Japan where cemeteries are going vertical. Um, you know, so you have you know, thousands of urns in this building and because there are thousands of urns in there, you can imagine that they're computerized so that you can press a button and your, your ancestor's urn will zoop, um, go into a room where you can honor them. Um, there is a wall of holographic Buddhas for prayer there, um, there's a company that will shoot your ashes into space. Um, and one chapter focuses on this idea of um, community where a neighborhood actually shares an urn, or shares a giant urn. And um, so it's kind of a space saving measure, um, but it's also something that sort of ties the community together. Um, so there's that kind of research where I was kind of thinking about, okay, what are people doing now? What are kind of the innovations 
with grieving and sort of the funerary, funerary industries. Um, and there was also the climate aspect. Um, I read an article in the Atlantic about, I think it was a 2014. And I, the headline was something like scientists um, wanting to uh, reactivate or um, bring back to life ancient viruses. And of course that, my knee jerk reaction was that's, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> you know, like, why would you do such a thing? Um, you know, of course, you know, the science perspective is like, well, we need to understand, you know, how these viruses function in the past because it might help us battle viruses in our present, right? Um, and, I, and I get that. Um, but kind of that horror movie fan in me kept saying, saying don't do it, don't do it because we, we don't know for sure like what, how this is gonna behave. Um, and, you know, maybe a little spoiler, the virus in my novel is not a normal virus at all. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't behave like anything that we've ever known. Um, it's, it's um, you know, the, the origins of it are very mysterious, you know, just as mysterious as um, the, the mummified girl that we see in that first chapter. Um, I said earlier that the novel also spans generations um, and that's the kind of research that I found a little bit more difficult to do because I was ha having to prophesize a little bit. Um, so I had needed to think about um, what does social media look like 10 years from now, 30 years from now, 60 years from now? You know, how are people going to be communicating on the internet or something like the internet, you know, um, you know in the next century? Um, and that's something I, I obviously like can't know for sure. So I started to look at trends. So, for example, um, I hope Facebook's not going to be around, you know, um, at that point. Um, but I do know that right now, you know, cryptocurrency is kind of like this. A lot of people think it's shady. It's like, uh, you know, like tech bros. And, and I get that. But at the same time, you know, as the pandemic was raging, I started to think about, OK, well, um, people are very capitalist. People are gonna be looking for ways to make money off of grief and off of tragedy. And sure enough, you know, I came across, um, you know, digital currency projects that were tied to the funerary, to the funerary, funerary industry. So parts of my chapters nod at the fact that uh, the funerary, funerary industry uh, essentially becomes as important as, a, as Google, right, as Amazon. Um, you know, because of this global pandemic, um, that is in some ways much worse than, than what we're experiencing because it's just very unusual. Um, people that run crematoriums, funeral homes, they become, um, they start merging together and they form these huge sort of conglomerates that control the banking system, they control, you know, the money that we use kind of on a daily basis. Um, they even have a foot into um, social media as well. And so that I was thinking about, you know, what industries would have power in a world that's kind of been upturned um, by, by tragedy. And it would probably be, you know, something to do with, you know, both pharmaceutical companies and the funerary industry. So that's kind of long answer. No, thank you. That was really interesting. I had no idea about the holographic Buddhas or um, the vertical, Funerals, that's so fascinating. Um, I'm gonna follow up with another question for you. This one is from Roy. Um, in your reading, I kept thinking about comics, video games, and movies in conversation with your work. What artists, writers, films have inspired your approach to this book? Is this also, for Yeah, oh, this is for okay. you. I'm sorry, I might have been talking oh, okay. too fast there. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so what artists, writers, films have inspired? I, I would say, um, Stanis, like I guess off the top of my head, Stanislaw Lem, um, Solaris, um, is, is kind of always been like a big inspiration to me, uh, both the novel and then also the two films, uh, the, the Steven Soderbergh film and the, the, and the Tarkovsky uh, version. Um, because there's, um, if, if you've read the book or, or, or know anything about the films, we're kind of like, you know, off in space on the space station um, that's kind of hovering over this like very strange sun. And um, it's a kind of a psychological horror. And I wanna 
necessarily calling my novel a psychological horror, but there's emptiness in 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 my chapters in in in, in my passages um, that my characters sort of need to inhabit, right? Um, and it's kind of the emptiness, whether because somebody died or because the world has been upturned, where they have to kind of really reconcile with their past. And sometimes their past is haunting them. Um, in Solaris, their past memories manifest and become real beings on the space station. That doesn't happen in my novel, but um, I feel like the past um, manifests in ways that sort of governs how they behave uh, in terms of how they might move forward in life. Although I, I should say, I, I lied a little bit. There is one chapter where memories kind of do manifest. Um, they're in this kind of void, um, mystical void. And um, it's not so much memories manifesting, they're able to relive memories um, and kind of step into the past. You can sort of think about memories floating in these like giant orbs and they're like, oh, there's my childhood. I can walk into that for a little bit and, and relive that. And, you know, imagine kind of being um, a comatose patient having this virus and suddenly you're existing in this space with millions of other people um, where you're kind of having the shared consciousness experience and you're able to actually walk into other people's memories. What would that do for community? to your understanding of what it is to be a human being? What would that do to your understanding of who you've been as a human being and as a person your entire life, right? So those are, those are kind of some of the questions that I was thinking about. And that I think, you know, Stanislaw Lem also asks. Um, J.G. Ballard um, is another writer that I think sort of delves in this territory a lot. Um, as far as um, film and television, um, I want to say uh, probably Contact, Carl, S Con uh, Carl Sagan's Contact, uh, both the novel and the film um, were, were kind of an inspiration to me. And um, I'm hoping that, that the Carl Sagan Foundation lets me keep the epigraph. <laughs> I, I contacted them for, for my novel um, because, uh, you know, it, it, both Cosmos of the series and just kind of like everything that Carl Sagan has done, mm -hmm. Uh, to kind of just imagine and spark curiosity about outer space and who we are as human beings as well um, is, is kind of a huge part of the work. Um, and, and his novel and the film Contact, I think is such a love letter to humanity. It's, it's about certainly reaching out to extraterrestrials, but it's also about who we are and how we react to um, the possibility of, of something else. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, so Vivian, this is for you. Um, during your reading, I kept thinking about archives and the people you've reached to access those archives, whether they be real or imaginary archives. What challenges have you run into in writing material that brings up memories from decades ago? Well, they are mostly my memories. I, I do have siblings who are still around. I have uh, friends and neighbors who are still around, but I did a lot of research um, at the Missouri Historical Society and newspapers. Uh, there's not a lot written about Mill Creek and what is written is um, about how it was a slum and it deserved to be torn down. Um, so I wrote this book really because I wanted to write about the people, the humanity. I didn't read anything. The only thing I read uh, in my research about the people was a number. You know, there were 20,000 people living there. It was, there were 452 acres, but I never read a name of anyone or, or what the living conditions were for those people, or what the relationships or the institutions were. So I was, really happy to be able to humanize um, that area that doesn't exist anymore. There is absolutely nothing to show that 20,000 people live there. Um, so the research was sparse, but it was always my memories. These stories, many of them I wrote over many years. 
Uh, and that's how this came together. They were individual stories that I, um, I wrote and then I joined a writing, a creative writing workshop to just develop them, uh, to try to figure out how to maybe combine them somehow and, and make just, I didn't know. I just didn't know what, what I wanted to do. And one thing led to another, but the research um, basically was just verifying my memories. Uh, my memories that may have been just a snapshot of, of a situation, a feeling, or, or a person, or a location. Uh, so sometimes I would bounce things off of um, some of my siblings. I didn't interview them, but I would say, do you remember this situation? And they would start talking, and I would get a lot of information for, from that. But I was very much uh, interested in writing about my memories of that time and those people. I hope that answered the question. No, I think you did a really good job. Um, that's, I had no idea so many people lived in that area. That's just so fascinating to me because I'd heard about it, but I didn't know it was so vast. Um, that's so sad. Yeah. I hear that all the time. I didn't know so many people. And the other, other one is where where was it where is it and i some people never heard of it and other people said i heard of it but you know i heard it was a slum and they tore it down so it is very the memory of the of the community is very very sparse no and it's important that you are um like telling that experience so that more people are aware and that memory doesn't get lost for sure um, so I have a question for all three of you. Uh, this is from Marnie. Each reading gave voice to fear of the unknown, things we can't control, whether rats in the walls or Ray describing waking, shaking in the arms of a doubtful skyline or in Sequoia's story of planetary survival. So the question is, how has the current political atmosphere influenced your recent work, especially for those of you in Minneapolis uh, during this very tense moment in history? I think that's Roy. It's for I. Um, I think it's. I think it can be for anyone. That's such a loaded. It's such a loaded question, right? I think my my immediate answer to that, based on what Vivian and Sequoia have said, is um, um, research, right? That for me, the unknown. Um, triggers this sense of like wanting to ask questions, you know, why is it unknown to me? Um, is it unknown to other people as well? And I think that um, something that that both Vivian and Sequoia are talking about, like sort of like the personal unknown versus the collective unknown, um, it's scary. I think that both instances can be scary and both instances can be um, sort of can spearhead creativity, can spearhead, you know, asking um, different questions, you know? I don't know who said this, right? That it's like, that that it's not about like genius. It's really about like asking, who's asking like the necessary questions. And I think that, um, I yeah, for me, that's really important. Um, in terms of the 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 poem that that I was, or the piece that I, that I was reading from, um, one of the issues that I think sort of propels um, that piece is like, one is how can you love someone so much, right? And be completely, um, you know, um, what should I say? I mean, caught off guard, right? Um, that that the relationship, that whatever it is that you thought wasn't, you know, that, that it was basically a major fabrication. Um, and so there's this idea of vulnerability, I think, in this, in this, this, this question of the unknown. But then I think that for me, especially towards the end of that piece where, that I read tonight, um, how do we, I, I literally kept thinking about like, how do I let light into these like places of hurt, places of pain, 
um, places of rancor, right? Places of um, wanting revenge, for instance. Um, and and it was, you know, I think as as you as you heard in the piece, it you know it involves like professionals. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it involves friends. Sometimes it involves, you know. Um, uh, psychotropics, like whatever it is that that that's necessary. So I think life is is just such a web of unknowns, and that's how I think of 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 that question. That was that was a really rich question. Yeah, you know, urban renewal, which is what uh, I write the time uh, uh, the what was happening during the time that I, I'm writing about mostly happened all over the country. I write about St. Louis and but in every major center in Cleveland, Detroit, D New York, um, all over. Um, the cities decided that they wanted to um, to support automobiles. It was as simple as that. They needed highways uh, and that was part of, of the development and it created jobs for men coming, white men coming back from the war um, and the land that they had allowed to uh, deteriorate as whites moved to the suburbs uh, left the cities to poor black and brown people for the most part and suddenly it was valuable to them. So it was basically a land grab. And the problem was, especially in St. Louis, was that we were segregated. And they had, a, they had laws and, and zoning plans that didn't allow Black people to live anywhere else. And suddenly, there we were. They wanted the land. But white people said, but where are they going? Well, they're fine there, they're contained. What, what do we do now? So that became the issue that they needed this land, but, but there was no place for black people to feel comfortable living. Uh, so it was a, a weird kind of a, a situation where they had to figure out uh, how to pay for a new place for this uh, contained group of people to live. And they built projects. Uh, and it took a, a number of years. The very first bond issue for, um, for t raising that whole community, that blighted community failed because of that reason. White people said, where are they going to live? And it took another eight years to pass a bond issue. In, the, in that interim, they built a huge housing project that failed in, in about 10 years in itself. Uh, so gentrification and, and what's going on today is just you know a replay of, of everything that happens when there's land that uh, people want, uh, whoever's there. Uh, is uh, in a bad situation if they don't, if, if we don't do something about how people can learn to live together. Yeah, um, I'll jump on that. Um, there's a character in my novel that's uh, lived for all of Earth history. She's billions of years old. So she has um, kind of this unique perspective on humanity and, and has become, I guess, more human over time and and has been kind of wrestling with this this question i guess of what is humanity and and what kind of person what kind of being i have i become living among people and loving them and losing them um and i guess kind of through that character and then i guess kind of part of the backbone of the novel is this idea of possibility you know both good and bad right and and we can kind of embrace that possibility and and but there's often we've often historically have been caught up in these cycles mm -hmm. of, you know, um, of tragedy, of violence, of, of racism. Um, and then sometimes there's moments of renewal, but then we find ourselves back, in you know, cycle. into these, into the, into that dark place again. Um, you know, a lot of the characters in my novel are either, either, uh, Asian American, Japanese, um, American or, or, or Japanese nationals. And, um, but it's not a book that, 
and I, and I really I mentioned this a lot when I was when I was selling the novel. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that people didn't see it as an Asian novel, you know, and and um, I and let me explain what I mean by that because, you know, when I first started writing, um, there weren't that many. I wasn't really exposed to Asian writers in high school, you know. Um, in college, I read some, but um, it wasn't really until you know, like my late 20s, early 30s, where I started seeing more Asian names kind of becoming part of the literary conversation. And, and that's, um, you know, literary conversation and also in, in film and television, you know, there, there just were very few Asian faces. And, and if they were there, they were either there for comic relief, they were there to establish this kind of immigrant story of, um, you know, kind of a rags to riches kind of story. Um, and, you know, or, or it was, you know, something that was kind of nodding in a, in a sort of like maybe kind of self-congratulatory way of, you know, we recognize and affirm, you know, the, the, the ills that we've done to Japanese Americans. And, you know, none of those things were my story to tell, you know, like my grandfather was in an internment camp, you know, he, he you know, my, my ancestors lost everything in San Francisco um, and had to start over. Um, mm -hmm. But again, you know, that wasn't my story to tell. And, and I'm, you know, um, I've, I've visited Japan, but, um, you know, I feel like a foreigner there as well. So what, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was also kind of telling the stories of um, Asian Americans who might be like third, fourth generation you know, and, and just depicting their lives as, you know, people that are, um, people that have Asian faces that happen to be suffering a tragedy. And in some way, and in a lot of ways, I think that's so important right now because of the anti-Asian sentiment regarding COVID-19 um, to tell stories of, you know, Asians and Asian Americans that are just living their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and not calling attention to their otherness or their exoticness or the fact that they're immigrants. Just the fact that they're, you know, trying to put food on the table and, you know, trying to get vaccines or, or, or trying to get to their loved ones. Um, and, and so that was something that was always kind of like, I was very cognizant of um, as I was writing and revising. Thank you. I feel like you guys are also well-spoken with that. Um, I have one last question from the chat, um, and it is for Roy. Um, I love prose poetry. Do you lean more towards it? And uh, do you have any sense of whether or not it has a particular uh, popular following as a form? Sorry, not particular, popular. <laughs> Thank you for that question, um, or those two questions. Um, it's really interesting because I often wonder um, you know, there, there are people who work in more than one genre, right? But um, how people end up deciding whether something ends up being an essay, a poem, you know, and, and then if they decide to do a poem, how, you know, is it going to have um, certain, you know, stanzas? Is it going to be a prose poem? And it's, it's for me in my process, I don't really, it's very rare when I know that something feels like a prose poem. I think a prose poem is something that definitely in revision, I, you know, I figure out. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of prose poetry has influenced me and it's because, you know, a lot of prose in general has influenced me. Um, and I've, I've written it a lot, um, but it's not, it doesn't really get published. Um, this question, I think is something that it, it, it brings up a memory that I have where um, I remember working on, on prose poems and submitting them to a few journals and they all kept coming back with like encouraging words, but they were not being accepted. And the minute I started, right, you know, adding uh, line breaks to them, that's the minute that they were getting published. And, and it was really weird because for me, like you know there is the there is the 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 lineated po poem that got published and then there's the other version that is like part of my heart right 
Um, but I do think that prose poetry doesn't really get published. Um, it often doesn't get read. However, I do want to say that because um, the question was asked about the popularity. I would say that it, it is in prose. Um, it's more hybrid, right? In, in hybrid works is where you start to see more of that prose poetry. And I was thinking, of course, of Claudia Rankin and um, Maggie Nelson, um, where you start seeing sort of like um, just just highly poetic language exists in a sort of, um, you know, wearing basically prose clothing. Um, and, but, but, but in Claudia Rankin's work, of course, you know, if you read, yeah, I mean, in most of her work, um, image also plays a major role um, in, in her pieces. So I feel like that's where a lot of books um, I see um, are going. But I do, I would love to see um, chunky, like prose poems come out more often, like whole collections come out. I know that there's a few that have been coming out recently. Um, and many of them are, are inspired by um, Russell Edson, who was, he was a brilliant writer, but he was also kind of ridiculous sometimes in his scenarios to the point that um, as one of my mentors, Ray Gonzalez uh, has pointed out, um, prose poems can also feel like, um, um, what is it called? Like basically like a joke, you know, you have like, you begin like, you know, this joke, you're telling this joke and then there's like this punchline, right? Um, it feels like a lot of prose poems. It's like the setup for like a stand up, like stand up comedy. So that's my answer to that. Thank you. No, man, I feel you. We really got to bring, we need some more love for the prose poem. I, I, I feel you. Um, do we have any more questions from the crowd? I'll take the silence as a no and the lack of anything in the chat as well. Well, I just want to say thank you all for coming. Um, the three of you are absolutely brilliant tonight. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members. Um, it's, it was really nice to see everyone here. And I am going to leave a little link in the chat. I just dropped it. Uh, we have all of our writers books available to purchase uh, through that link. So check them out, give them some support, show them some love. And Jason, any ending notes from you or are we? Nope, thanks for doing this. I know it's a long time coming for Vivian and a lot of you did it on short notice too. <clears throat> and just, I'm glad the scheduling worked out and we did this. It was everything I expected too, so thank you. Well, thanks you guys. I'm gonna end it here and everyone, you guys did a great job. Once again, another great reading. So thanks you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.